I want to talk to you guys about fallacies, which will be fun, uh, and then crime and security. So three interesting topics that somehow go together a, a little bit, at least, I think. So let's begin with the first topic, fallacies. What in the world is a fallacy? So there are uh, a bunch of places where you can go to learn about them. Wikipedia is great, honestly. But let's, let's learn about fallacies. And a fallacy, an argument with a fallacy in it, is incorrect. So this, this little subsection is going to try and answer this kind of question. Like, what kinds of arguments just aren't allowed at all? They're not logical. They're not correct. They should not be trusted. An argument with a fallacy should not be trusted. So let's, let's learn what those are. So fallacy is when you mess up while arguing. Pretty much what it means when you make an error during in reasoning during the course of an argument, and so the this is the noun a fallacy that could exist in an argument, and the adjective form is fallacious. An, an argument that is fallacious is automatically false because it has a fallacy in it. You cannot trust it anymore. It is not a good argument. All right, and so fallacies happen all the time. And they're very subtle, so that's why I want to teach you about them. So like people use fallacies. Corporations love to use fallacies to get you to buy stuff. Governments use fallacies propaganda, stuff like that, uh, and they're a lot of the time used to manipulate people. So we got to learn to look through them, understand that a fallacy is there, and uh, know that we can't trust whatever is being shoved in front of us, all right? Uh, the one big thing I want you guys to get out of these slides is I am eventually going to have you do an essay about fallacies and ask you to find some. Every fallacy has a name. You can't just say, oh, this argument has, uh, this argument has a fallacy, or this argument is fallacious, so it's wrong. You have to give the exact type of fallacy, all right, in this class. Fallacy does, doesn't just mean bad argument. Like, it might in the wild. Fallacy is a specific kind of problem with an argument, and there is a specific kind of fallacy that was in it, all right? So every fallacy has a name, and I want you to use the names in this class, all right? And we'll require that. That's all. So, yeah. I just have a few that I want to teach you today. You'll learn some more on your own, but uh, yeah, here are some examples of fallacies. Uh, if you see an argument, with these fallacies in them, it is wrong, all right? So the first one is called false dilemma. Another word for that is false dichotomy. There's a, a bunch of different people call this fallacy a bunch of different things. It's also called the black and white fallacy. Nothing's just black and white, right? There's always gray fallacy. So this fallacy is when somebody's arguing to you, but there are only two options. Like, you got this option or you got this option. Pick one, all right? But really... That was a lie. Really, there's more than that. There's always a third secret option, maybe infinite options, all right? So it makes the illusion that there's only two possibilities, but in reality, there's probably more than that, all right? So there's that. Uh, so here are just some silly examples, like I stole from the internet. It's always like X or Y. It's saying X or Y is true, but really there's probably a, a Z that you could choose from, right? There's, there's a third option, at least, all right? called false dilemma fallacy. So here are some silly uh, arguments. So there are only two kinds of people in the world, people who love Phoebe Bridgers and people who hate music, right? That is a, an emotionally charged argument and it it's a, has a fallacy in it. It has the false dilemma inside of it because there's probably some unfortunate souls who love music, just not Phoebe's music, okay? That's the idea. And then here's like a button from a political campaign, like USA, love it or leave it. They're giving you two options, but there's a, always a secret third option. There's like, maybe you could become uh, like a leader of some alternative party or something. You could stay in the USA and change it for the better. There's your third option, right? False dilemma. Another example, this one I did really steal off the internet. It's like, Stacy spoke out against socialism, so she must be a fascist, right? So... It's like giving you two art, two options. You can be a socialist or a fascist, but nothing in between. Yeah. When in reality, maybe um, there is some other option. Okay, so that's false dilemma. Just making you giving you the painting the picture that there's only two options, but really there's more than that. Right? I'm sure you've you've heard phrases like this before. Right? Love it or leave it. Stuff like that. That um, technically not correct. So if you hear that, it's wrong. Any questions about false dilemma, false dichotomy, black and white fallacy? All right, here's another one. A lot of fallacies are built on top of logic, and logic started back in the Roman times, and so uh, it's when they, they were all philosophers back then, right? So a lot of fallacies have Latin names. This one's called ad populum. 
which uh, it's Latin for like to the populace, to the popularity, to the people, something like that. It's also called the bandwagon fallacy. So everybody's jumping on the bandwagon. And so the ad populum fallacy is when you're making an argument and you're assuming that something is true or good or right to do just because other people agree with it. Right? So that's the problem. That is not a good enough reason to say that it's a good thing. Right? That is a fallacy. It's, it's going along with the populace. Like, here's the populace, the population of people. Got all these people who think, uh, who like thing X. Like, this person likes thing X. All these people like thing X. There's so many of them. And so the ad populum fallacy is noticing that and saying, oh, yeah, X must be a good thing. X is good. Because all these people like it. Does that make sense? That is that is a fallacy, of course, uh, because maybe X is really horrible, but all these people were somehow brainwashed into liking it or something like that. Okay, so here are some good examples of the ad populum fallacy. You'll see this a lot in advertisements. It's a good way to advertise something to somebody. It's like you drink Gatorade because that's what all the professional athletes are drinking to stay hydrated, right? That's selling Gatorade to people. You've seen posters that are video ads that look like that, I'm sure. That's the ad populum fallacy. Don't just do it because everybody else is doing it. Maybe they were all paid to use Gatorade or something like that. They're getting ad revenue from all the people who are listening to this ad. So that's the ad populum fallacy. It's got ad in the name. All right. Uh, what else? Here's one that I might believe. I don't know. Jimi Hendrix used Fender Stratocaster, so obviously I need one. All right. That's the ad populum fallacy. Buy another good smart, make it your own. Still will sound nice, right? You don't need something that somebody else had, all right? And then the standard one that you're going to see a lot is like, all right, I have, I think this thing because my parents think this thing. My parents believe this thing is true or good or nice, so I must too. I think it's good as well because that's what they say. And that is uh, obviously how bad things become propagated through time. Yes, we don't like that. So that is the ad populum fallacy, all right? Just because a bunch of people think something's nice doesn't mean that it's really nice. They might just all be delusional, yeah. Any questions about that? So you need a better argument. You can't trust somebody who uses this fallacy, all right? I gotta give you some real concrete reasons, not just because other people like it. Why do they like it? Maybe there's really a reason deep down somewhere, but this isn't it. Okay? All right. If we are happy, let's have a bunch of them. You'll learn some more when I give you an essay about this. But uh, here's another one. It's called circular reasoning. You might have heard that term before. Circular reasoning, if we bring back all of this to, uh, like, logic and stuff, it's when you are repeating your assumption as your conclusion. You know, when you make an argument, you have a bunch of assumptions and you're using that as firepower towards your conclusion. Circular reasoning is when you're actually repeating your assumption, like assume this is true and then conclude that, oh yeah, it must have been true. <laughs> but you were assuming it. Obviously, that's an incorrect argument. You can't just prove something that you assumed. Maybe it was incorrect to assume it. And so this sounds like it's totally easy to notice, but it's, it's actually really subtle. And I'll show you some examples of that. So it's like assume... Like somebody's saying, assume X is good. And they do this in a very subtle way. And then they somehow try and prove to you that, therefore, X must be good. It sounds silly. It sounds like you'd notice it, but it is hard. So another word for this is uh, begging the question. All right? So a lot of times, people will use circular reasoning and they'll hide behind large words. So let's... Let's have some examples of that. That's the easiest example of circular reasoning. Opium induces sleep because it has a soporific quality. I think that's how you pronounce that. Let me look that up real quick. A soporific or a soporific? It is soporific. Yeah. All right. It has a soporific quality. Soporific just means it puts you to sleep. Right? This, this sentence is saying nothing. So that's, that's a problem. And then here's like a silly example from a recent election. It's like, I'm not voting for this person because they can't win. And they can't win because not enough people are voting for them. You see how that's a circular kind of argument? This goes back around on itself. Well, maybe you should get a bunch of people to vote for them. Solve the problem. Not circular reasoning. All right. And then another example is just 
everyone wants to buy Phoebe Bridger's new album because it is the hottest album this season. What? Everyone wants to buy it because everyone wants to buy it. That's what that's saying, right? That's circular reasoning again. It makes no sense if you think about it long enough. So, yeah, it's usually hiding behind large words that uh, makes it a little bit subtle and hard to notice. Here's a, a fun one that I stole from the internet, a longer one. It's like, to allow every man an unbounded freedom of speech must always be, on the whole, advantageous to the state, for it, it is highly conducive to the interests of the community that each individual should enjoy a liberty perfectly unlimited of, of expressing his sentiments. It's a very long, flowery phrase trying to argue for freedom of speech, right? It's like, but this is a circular circularly reasoned statement, so let's try and pick it apart. To allow every man an unbounded freedom of speech must always be, unbounded freedom of speech must always be advantageous. So it's like, all right, freedom of speech must be good. We should, we should have it. It must be a good thing. For, because it is highly conducive to the interests of the community that each individual should enjoy a liberty perfectly unlimited of expressing his sentiments. Do you see how these two underlying statements are saying the same thing? You should have freedom of speech because you should have freedom of speech. Freedom of speech is good because freedom of speech is good. And so there, it's not a real argument at that point. See how it is subtle if you, if you drone on like this. That is a problem. That is circular reasoning. That's not, you can't use an assumption as a conclusion. Doesn't, doesn't prove your conclusion, right? That's the idea. Any questions about that? Begging the question. These are fun ones. I hope you, um, every time I give you a new slide, you're thinking about, oh, this is the last time I heard something like this. That's good. Good studying. Hopefully you've seen some of these before. All right. Uh, this is another one that has a Latin term in it. Denying the antecedent. So this one is harder to notice. It, it doesn't come up too much in real life. It comes up more in like actual mathematical proofs. This is a logical, it's called a formal fallacy when it has to do with logic like this one does. So this, everybody, every one before this was called an informal fallacy. It doesn't have a lot to do with logic. It's just like you're doing some, you're speaking English wrong. Uh, so this one is when you are reasoning in the form of an if-then statement. You're like saying, if P is true, then Q must be true. You're trying to prove something like that. Uh, and then you're trying to conclude, or sorry, you're, you're, you're assuming that this is true. If P is true, then Q must be true or good or whatever. You're assuming this, that P implies Q. And then you're using that as firepower to prove a conclusion of saying, well, if not P, then not Q must be true, that proving their negations. If you assume this and you're trying to show that, all right, if P is true, then Q is true, then it must also be the case that if not P is true, then not Q is true, which is weird to think about. But here's a good example with words that will have this make sense, right? So here's, here's an example argument that has this fallacy, the denying the antecedent fallacy. This is not a correct conclusion, surprisingly. Here's a good example why. So here are two assumptions. Assume this and assume this. And here is a conclusion based on those assumptions. Let's see. And then here's what it's being concluded. Conclude. All right. So if you are a ski instructor, then you have a job. That, that's, an, that's a valid assumption, right? So if P, this could be P, right? You are a ski instructor. That could be our P. Then you have a job. Q. All right. And then you're trying to conclude this, and this is an incorrect conclusion. This is trying to say, if not P, then not Q. So it's like, assume not P is true. Here's not P. Assume you're not a CE instructor, right? And then they're concluding from that that not Q must be true. All right, if you're not a CE instructor, therefore you, you have no job. You have no job at all. Not Q. Do you see that that is an incorrect conclusion? Like, all right, uh, if you're not a CE instructor, then you must have no job at all. When in reality... That is, that's not true. This is a true statement. If you are a ski instructor, then you do have a job. That is correct. But it's incorrect to say, if you're not a ski instructor, then you don't have a job, right? Because maybe you're a teacher. Maybe you're a student. Maybe you work as a snowboard instructor. I don't know. But do you see the problem there? You cannot apply the negation on both sides and have it follow from this assumption. It's incorrect. There are plenty more options there, right? And so this doesn't really happen too much in real life because it's so obviously wrong. But when you're 
pushing symbols around doing logical stuff uh, in a mathematical form. This does come up sometimes. It is correct to do the opposite, though. It is, like, if you assume this, it is correct to conclude that not Q implies not P. And uh, try using the C instructor example. I think you'll, you'll see it. This one, this one does work. You can go from P implies Q to not Q implies not P, but you can't do it this way. You can't keep them on the same side. You've got to flip them. So that's, that's denying the antecedent. A weirder one. Are you good with that one? Yeah, we are. That's a good one. All right, here's another informal fallacy, one that happens in, like, English speech. This is called the two quoque fallacy. It's a fun little word, quoque. That's another Latin term. It's Latin for you too, so you too, you also. And it's also called the appeal to hypocrisy. So this is, this is definitely a fun one. What two quoque is all about is you're trying to distract from the argument at hand by, like, saying that your opponent is a hypocrite in, in like, criticizing you for something. It's all about deflecting blame, trying to, like, get away from the limelight because, oh no, I did this bad thing, but so did you. You too. That's, what, that's what's happening. So here's some fun examples. Or here's, like, a very common example in politics. It's like, the U.S. has criticized Russia for doing something silly. Uh, Ukraine, for example. Uh, and then Russia responds, right, by not saying, oh yeah, I did a bad thing, sorry, They'd say something like, oh, hey, U.S., you know what you did back in the 60s or whatever? No. You'd have no right to be saying that I did a bad thing. You have no right to be criticizing me. All right? So that's, that's the two quoque fallacy. It's responding to someone saying, you did this bad thing by saying, you have also done that bad thing. All right? But maybe, right, this is, this is a fallacy because you can be a hypocrite and still be right. Maybe the U.S. has learned from their mistakes, right? And they're trying to point it out in their political rivals or whatever. You can you can be a hypocrite and still be correct about things. And that's why it's a fallacy. Yeah. Let's see if I can spell hypocrite. Hypocrite. And still be right. That's that's the idea. That's the two quote cool fallacy. You're allowed to say that somebody did a bad thing, even if you did that bad thing once upon a time. They have no right to, to criticize you for saying it because it's still it's still right to point it out. Something like that. The two quoque fallacy is turning around the argument on your opponent, saying you did it too, you too. That's the idea. Any questions about that one? So politics is a great example of when this happens. All right. Um, this is a harder one to explain. I have no pictures because I had to include a lot of words. This one I'm required to teach you, but I don't understand it the best because it is a weirder one. But let me let me show you what I know at least. This is called the genetic fallacy. All right, this is when you are arguing. Somebody's arguing about something, and they are solely basing their argument on the thing's history, like the old stuff that has happened to this thing that is the topic of the argument, like its history, its origin, where it came from. When that information is not relevant, that's the key when that information is not at all relevant. So genetics, you like your family tree, the history of you, the history of the argument, the history of the thing you're talking about. So this is the genetic fallacy. It's when you are talking about the past. Talking about the past when, it's, when it is not relevant anymore. When it, it's no longer relevant. And so this doesn't come up too much, but here's a good example. Like, abstractly, it's like something used to be horrible, but times have changed and it's okay now. So you can't like argue against it anymore. So here's like, here's the best example I found off the internet about the genetic fallacy. It's like, you're not going to wear a wedding ring, are you? Don't you know that the wedding ring originally symbolized ankle chains worn by women to prevent them from running away from their husbands? I would not have thought you would be a party to such a sexist practice, right? So this is somebody trying to argue against wearing wedding rings, okay? I have no idea if this is true, by the way. Has, anybody, has any of us looked into this? But this is, somebody's trying to say that a wedding ring is bad because it used to mean this. It used to symbolize this. But nowadays, right, that is not at all what a wedding ring stands for. It's like the love between two people, yes? We, we think nothing about this. We've never even heard of this, most of, it, most of us. So, obviously, the whole nature of a wedding ring has changed over time, and it makes no sense to use this argument. All right? That's the idea. So, 
So it's a bad argument because whatever your argument or whatever your complaint is, it's not relevant. Okay? That's the genetic fallacy. It's like the history of something. You're trying to apply that history when in reality it, it doesn't apply anymore. Okay. That's that. Uh, here's another example I found from the internet. It's like, this news story about the Purple Party candidates must be fake since it was made by XYZ News. And we all know that that XYZ News station is owned by someone who hates the Purple Party. All right? And so this is another example of the genetic fallacy. They're, they're trying to say that, obviously, they can't report anything factual about the Purple Party because we know this news station does not like the Purple Party. They like to call it out as much as they can. But in reality... That's that's a fallacy still, because maybe they really found some news that is relevant and the Purple Party finally did do something wrong for once. All right? The origin of the sort of the news has doesn't mean it's false, right? Origins have no impact on truth. That is the genetic fallacy. That's the best I can think to explain it. Any questions about that? It's like using the origin of something. It's like knock it down, but in reality it's not relevant. Yeah. I think you could go there. I, I could see that. Yeah. Like you have this this bias against wedding rings, this bias to get, this bias against this news channel, and so you you don't want to agree with them. Yeah, I could see that happening. Yeah. It could definitely be tied into bias. Absolutely. That's a good thought. Any other comments, questions? All right. Uh, a few more, and then I have some questions for you guys to see if you can pick them apart, see if you remember the words. So here's a fun one, the straw man fallacy. So uh, another word for this is, or another phrase to describe this is putting words in someone's mouth. Putting words. I'm sure you've heard that phrase before. Putting words in someone's mouth when they didn't say those things. So the straw man fallacy is when you have an argument that is attacking a position that your opponent doesn't actually hold. Interesting. And the reason you're attacking this false position is because it's really easy to knock that one down. You turn their maybe good argument into some other one that is made of straw, right? That's why it's a straw man argument. It's very, you can knock down a straw man pretty easily, right? Not a real person. So here is a good example of a straw man fallacy. It's like, here's a lawyer, and they're talking about uh, a bank robbery case, and they're trying to say uh, that you should find this person guilty for robbing the bank. All right? so I submit to you that if you can't take this evidence and find these defendants guilty, then we might as well open all the banks and say, come on and get the money, boys, because we'll never be able to, give it, to convict them. Okay, so somebody's trying to say, we better convict this person because we're never going to be able to convict anyone else again, ever, if we let this person go free. That is a straw man fallacy because I don't think that the, the defense was trying to say anything like this. Maybe all the evidence against this bank robber was circumstantial or something like that. When in and like they should be acquitted because there's not enough evidence or some, some normal reason like that, but this person's trying to say that, no, we... If we don't convict this one bank robber right now, we're never going to convict any other bank robber in the future. And I don't think that that is what the defense is saying at all. They're just trying to protect this one person, right? So they're putting words into the defense's mouth, all right, this prosecutor. That's the idea. That's the straw man fallacy. They're trying to say that, oh, obviously, uh, you're trying to acquit every single bank robber, when in reality, no, just this one. Just this one that probably shouldn't be thrown in jail. Something like that. That's the straw man fallacy. Here's another example of the straw man fallacy. Some people are conversing about like music. So the children's winter concert at the school should include some non-Christmas songs too, says person A. And then person B responds by saying, you won't be happy until Christmas songs are banned from being played on the radio. That is, person B is the one with the straw man fallacy, right? That's popping up there because that is not at all what person A says. Maybe they just like that one Taylor Swift song that uh, doesn't have to do with Christmas, right? That is wintry themed, whatever. They're, they're not trying to cause some sort of ideological debate. Yeah. 
That is the straw man fallacy. They're putting words in person A's mouth. Okay, that's the idea. Any questions about that? This is a very common one that comes up in real life, so maybe if you've had an argument before, you you can remember that uh, straw man was a part of it. It's like I didn't say that. You're trying to you're trying to make me you're trying to make me come off as having said something that I didn't say. All right, you ready for the last one of this section? It's the last fallacy I want to teach you today. It's called ad hominem, and this is probably the most common one, especially on the internet. It is uh, again Latin. It's for uh, it means to the man or to the person, to the human. Uh, it's when you're attacking the arguer instead of the argument. And so obviously, this is very common on the internet. It's really when you're insulting somebody. You're, you're using like that attack on the person. that you're, Like you're attacking a person, you're insulting a person, you're using that as firepower towards your own conclusion that has nothing to do with the person involved. Right? So it's like you're making fun of somebody. You're saying that they suck and like that's why they're wrong. When obviously that's a fallacy, okay? Here are some examples I stole from the internet. Uh, Jones likes a football team from the East Coast, so clearly he's unfit to be a police chief in California, right? So they're attacking the person, like, okay, he has these tastes that are not good, they're not Californian tastes, and so they, they must influence his ability to be a police chief. There's no link between those, right? That is ad hominem. You're attacking the person, not actually trying to argue why he might be a bad police chief. Okay? It has nothing to do with it. All right? And here's, here's an ad hominem fallacy that a lot of us, if we were on a jury, we might believe. We might, we might find this to be a true statement, which is very tricky. And so you have to notice that, oh, yeah, this is an ad hominem fallacy still. It's, I shouldn't be trusting it. I should be looking for more information. So here's one that you might hear from like, if you're sitting on a trial. Like, you cheat and lied to your wife, but you expect the jury to believe you now? Hmm. So maybe this is true. Maybe this person really did cheat and lie to their wife, but the trial is about something completely different. Something absolutely different. This is an ad hominem fallacy still. It's attacking the person rather than giving an argument for why they uh, should be convicted of some potentially very different crime. Okay. That's the idea, because maybe, maybe the trial has nothing to do with this. This is trying to use their personality to, to attack their credibility. Maybe the case, they're just in the wrong place at the wrong time, has nothing to do with this. Just because you made a very bad mistake once upon a time doesn't mean you, uh, every time, like, something else comes up, you were the perpetrator, right? That's the idea. So that's ad hominem. Uh, and then here's another one that I'm sure you've heard your parents say at least once. Like, you're too young to, other, to understand, rather than telling you what you asked for, trying to argue against you. You're too young to understand. That is That is an ad hominem attack. You're attacking the person rather than whatever is the discussion, okay? You're not giving an argument, really. That, that is ad hominem to the person. You're attacking them rather than actually giving a real argument. Any questions about that one? Oh, all right, it's very philosophical today, I think. If we are good, uh, please make sure that you have done the attendance. I will stop that after this first question, but please go to the buy clicker page on the class website get together in groups and help each other. Here is your first question. Here is a tweet that I stole from somewhere. Uh, I guess I stole it from Twitter once upon a time, but maybe I stole it. somebody else's screenshot because I didn't make those highlights. Uh, I found it somewhere, but there is a fallacy in this tweet. Which of these is it? Have I started the question? Let me make sure. Begin. Okay. So take a couple minutes to think about this one. There is a fallacy in this tweet, This these words up here. Which one is it? See if you can remember. What do you think? I don't think it would be bad if you're from a chemical Too, 
for us to click the OK. This was at like the height of the alternative we had been able to create a couple of weeks. Let's try it to do an import this year and do a persuasive one. That is not the topic I'm after here. All right, I think that was enough time. Get your best answer in, or best guess at least. Well, let's see, let's see here. Nice. What are we thinking? Oh yeah, we're thinking mostly D, maybe B. But D is in fact the right answer. Dang it. Would somebody uh, like to explain why they chose D? Because that's the one I would pick as well. Why'd you pick that one? Well, I think yeah. it was my. I was the first one to pick D because, like, would you rather see false? Would you rather meet your meat from a chemical factory or an industrial state on an industrial state or a green field in the middle of the countryside? But the reason why I picked D was because it's because if you pick D, is because like we all know that meat doesn't come from meat doesn't come from like a chemical factory. It comes from animals. Okay, but apply this to false dilemma. What does it mean to be false dilemma, and why do you see false dilemma specifically in this sentence? I don't know. Okay, but we, just on vibes alone, we thought it was D. Yeah. I respect that. But, yeah, very good. That's what I was looking for. Awesome. So it's saying, this, this tweet is saying, all right, would you like to see your meat come from a chemical factory or a green? field. Those are your two options. Those are the only two options. You see how that's a false dilemma fallacy? Because we live in Fresno. We know that there are brown fields with cows everywhere. There is your secret third option there, at least. Right? So, that is a false dilemma fallacy. Okay? Any questions about that? Seems like we were getting that. Here's your other one. All right? Here is a uh, another... I think this is a Facebook comment I found very easy to find fallacies dealing with politics. They come up a lot because they're heated arguments. People accidentally use fallacies a lot. So identify the fallacy in this Facebook comment. So here's like, here's something I stole from like one of the local news stations. Like they, this was back during the pandemic. And so Biden was like, uh, hey, go, go get your shot today. He said this, go get your shot today. There is no time to waste nationwide case, COVID cases, by the way. COVID cases are still rising. That's what he's talking about especially among the unvaccinated. So that was his phrase. That's what he said. That was the start of the post. And then there was a comment to the post that said, uh, this person said, BS, even the vaccinated are getting COVID. There's a fallacy in this statement, all right? There's a fallacy, and which one do you think it is? I think there are several valid answers to this one, but there's one that I would pick. So it's like, BS, even the vaccinated. You know that there are two, there are 
fine tuning those speeds to the different throttle points. Let's toss out the uh, so at least straw man is perfect. Because that would be if they're not trying to like don't have fall down. Yeah, I'll just get the first one out because the first one out is the Might be a Okay. Right, let's get our best guessing or the right answer. Seconds. All right, let's see what we're thinking. Who? We're not so sure this time, but we're thinking maybe C. With with the majority, we're thinking C, and that is also the one that I would say. I think I could see I could see it being C. Let me remember to stop that. Uh, boop. All right, so yeah, nice. We're not so sure though. So let's let's take a look at this. So I do think that C would be a good answer. I think that's the one that I would pick. And the reason why is like, this argument is trying to put words in the president's mouth. That's what a straw man fallacy means. It's like, even the vaccinator getting COVID, did, did this statement say anything about the vaccinated not getting COVID when you get a vaccine? No, I'd say, if anything, all it means to have a vaccine is like you're going to get a, if you get infected, you're, it's going to be like a less serious case, right? That's all it means to have a vaccine. So he's, he's putting words in Biden's mouth by saying this. Like, we're, the argument was never to not get COVID. It was to not die when you get COVID, right? So that is why I would call it a straw man fallacy. It's like you're, you're arguing against something that has not even been done. I might pick uh, pick C there, but I could also see it like like nationwide cases are rising, especially among the unvaccinated. We're saying nothing about the vaccinated not getting COVID, so that's why I think it's straw man. But I could also see it as a two quote way. It's like you're getting COVID too, something like that. Even the vaccinated are getting COVID. You're getting COVID too. You too. But uh, morally, I, I think if you look up the definition of two quote it's not quite that's exactly what it means. But I could see how you might think that that is a good example here. So I would give you credit for it as well. Two quote way, like yeah, you're getting vac you're getting COVID too. So I sh I don't need to get the vaccine. It's, it makes no difference. You too. But I think uh, the best option in my mind would would have been something like a straw man fallacy. Any questions about that? It is subjective. If I'm going to give you an essay about finding fallacies, and as long as you like explain why you think it's this fallacy, that's that's all that I'm looking for. I'll give you credit. All right. Um, let's see here. I wouldn't say anything about uh, ad populum here. It's not trying to say do this because everybody else is doing it. Uh, let's see here. I guess there's a concept of a group, like the vaccinated versus the unvaccinated group. But uh, yeah, maybe thinking about it more. I think you could maybe make an argument for ad populum as well. If you're trying to like argue like, oh, the people, there's more people getting the vaccine, therefore it's a good thing, something like that. But uh, hopefully this argument, if you read the full version of it, it was about the medical properties of the vaccine rather than just like do it because everybody else is doing it. But that is, yeah, I can go on all day about this. It is, it's all subjective, but I think I would pick C. That's all. Any questions about that? All right, I have some other topics for the day. Let's see how much of it we can get through. I want to talk about crime now. Crime and security, bad things. Ooh, that's good. I love crime and security. All right. So, uh, yeah, I'll try to answer these questions. Like, what, what bad stuff has happened be thanks to technology? Like, technology is so good, but some bad things have happened. Let's talk about it. And then, like, how can we stay secure on the Internet, which is, like... The NSA is spying on us all, right? 
how can we stay secure still? So let's talk about the word hacking to begin with. Like that's that's a very common case of crime on the internet. Like a hacker does something. Back in the day, actually, hacking meant a good thing. It was a positive adjective. It just meant that somebody was good with computers. They were a hacker. It meant nothing. There was no bad connotation back then, back in the day. Uh, and still, like among programmers, the word hack doesn't mean anything bad. It's like, oh man, the, the class website, it's a complete hack. And I would be proud if somebody said that. It's like, it still works. A hack in programming lingo still means something different. But to the, the normal population, it means a bad thing. And so, why? Now, now it means such bad things. What, what's the reason? It's because of the news, right? There were some hackers that got out of hand, right? They're starting to cause real damage now that computers are interconnected. The second like, you start being able to like, dial up a phone number and connect to a computer, suddenly you can do bad things. So I guess the first example of doing weird stuff with phone lines is called uh, is like the, the proto-hackers. They were the phone freakers. This is freaking phone number. Okay. So this is a fun example of like the world's first hackers. What they did is, uh, do we all know what a payphone is? We all watched at least a movie with a payphone in it. Okay, good. It's just a box, right? It's just a box with a phone. I don't think they have any these days, but it's a box. There's a phone on the box. And what you can do is you put money in, put money in the slot, and then like it's connected to the phone line. You can call somebody because there were no cell phones back in the day. So that's phone freaking. And so, uh, or that's t pay phones. So phone freakers back in the 70s, they made little boxes battery-powered boxes that would fake the tones that it made when you put in a quarter. If you put in like a money, it would make a noise, and then it would transmit the noise across the phone lines, and that's how the, like the, the system on the other end would know that money has been put in to the phone, bo uh, the phone booth. And then it would make a call. And so they made devices to fake that sound you just put it through the, the voice piece. It didn't make any difference. It was still sound going through. And so it let people, like, uh, I think there's a fun story you can look up on the internet of somebody, one of the phone freakers, getting into the Vatican and almost calling the Pope. They got to the person right before the Pope, which is a really funny story. Uh, and so this was, like, mostly innocuous. Just people trying to see what they could do, not trying to cause any trouble. But uh, eventually, once phones and computers got connected now you can make like worms and viruses and things and those are actually two different terms that we might not know the difference between so let me define them. a virus is when you have a bad program and like you have to download it like you have to download the bad program and you have to double click it you have to activate it yourself so like i actually accidentally downloaded the song but it wasn't a song i double clicked it and it gave me a virus something like that so that's what a virus is a worm does not need to be double clicked that's the difference so, a worm is a bad program that's capable of self-replication and self-activation. Self so a worm can propagate on its own, but a virus, you gotta, you got to mess up somehow. That's the idea, right? And obviously, it's the internet that caused these to be things. Yeah. And yeah, so that's, that's what's going on with the word hackers and things like that. But uh, it's kind of come full circle now because companies, they are hiring hackers. White hat hackers, we say. Uh, companies hire hackers nowadays to test their security, to try and hack in before the bad guys get in. There's always a cat and mouse game of like legal hackers versus illegal hackers now. Uh, but yeah, bad things have happened. I'm sure you've seen in the news plenty of cases of like lots of personal information, lots of financial information getting stolen, and hackers were behind it. So we don't like that. Uh, that's crime on the internet, a very common crime. Some other fun crimes to talk about. I think this one's in the textbook. It was called Stuxnet. This was a worm. So it, it, uh, it was a program, a bad program maybe, that propagated by itself, unbeknown, unbeknowingly to uh, the users of computers. And this was a very specific worm. It targeted a very specific type of computer. It was like a control system that operated heavy, heavy machinery that was dealing with like uranium enrichment. And so it noticed when it was on that specific kind of computer, and then it infected it, which is very weird. Then it turned itself on. Uh, so it only infected very specific computers, and it ended up damaging the heavy machinery that was attached to it, which is fun, in a uranium enrichment plant in Iran back in 2008. And so this was back when uh, 
the countries of the world didn't like Iran making a uranium enrichment program. They didn't think that they were just going to do nuclear energy, something like that. And so the rumor is, and it's probably a, safe to assume that this is really true, it's that the U.S. and Israel together, they built this worm and they infected this computer. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of a fun little story. Espionage kind of thing. But, yeah, you can make a very specific kind of program that stops very certain computers from, very specific kinds of computers from doing things. That's a fun little idea. Uh, Stuxnet, maybe you've heard of that. It's been a while now. That's a fun example of maybe good people making a program to do to do something. That still is a worm at the end of the day. Uh, next, I want to talk about a target breach. This was back in 2013, so it's a decade ago, I guess. Uh, this is a fun one. Maybe we've heard about this one. Maybe we know somebody. Uh, last semester, actually, I had a student who was involved with the breach. Like They got some, some of their financial information stolen because of it. Maybe you know somebody, too. But this was, this is a fun one. So back in 2013, a contractor was working for Target. They were called Fazio Mechanical. They were like, they were doing HVAC stuff. They were doing heating, air conditioning, refrigeration, maintenance for Target. And, uh, which is fine. But they were given passwords. And so they would eventually log into a Target system and like run their software to fix their, their AC or whatever. And so... It was these people who got hacked. So let me let me just write this. And that eventually led to Target car, Target getting hacked. So it wasn't um, actually Target that got hacked originally. Target that got hacked originally, at least. And so what happened was. There. Uh, there was a phishing attempt. If we, if we work somewhere, we have a job we usually have to do every year, a phishing training. I know I do, at least. Uh, so phishing is when you attempt, like somebody sends you a, a fake email that looks legit. Maybe you've gotten some of those to your, uh, to your personal email before. It's like somebody's trying to like ask you to log in, click to change your password. Oh, it's been expired or something. They're pretending to be someone that they're not. It's a phishing email, an example of phishing. And so they're trying to get you to enter in your password that really looks like Amazon or really looks like Google, but is not trying to steal your stuff. Um, and so an employee at this place, this Fazio Mechanical, they got sent a phishing email. They thought it was legit. They clicked a link, logged in, uh, and that eventually gave them a, a, a virus. And that virus, all it did was it stole usernames and passwords and login information, stuff like that. But... Fazio Mechanical eventually logged into a target system, and the virus, maybe I should have said worm instead, the virus propagated itself, and eventually it, it found usernames and passwords for target systems. And so it gained access to credit card data that is uh, that was being that was tried to be like kept secret, but uh, they found a way to get at it. And so a lot of credit card fraud happened because of that. And because a lot of people go to Target, there's a lot of different credit cards stored in their system. And so banks ended up having to spend upwards of $200 million just for the fraud, like just, or just to like reissue the credit cards, right? To give a bunch of people, lots of people, new credit cards on top of like having to cancel all the transactions that were fraudulent. So it's a very expensive breach. Um, and it was in the news a lot back then. Maybe we, it's been a while, but. Maybe we've heard a little bit about it. Any questions, comments about that? It's a fun little example. So this is just examples of bad things on the internet. Like what? Security issues, crime. What's, what has happened? So we can think about it. Uh, let's see, what else do I want to say? Uh, we've got some time. Uh, there's also some good things about security in the, in the digital age in which we live. You have biometrics now. Like we all have face ID on our phone or like touch ID to unlock. Uh, if you have an iPhone or something. Biometrics is using biological data as, like, a password. It's like your fingerprint. Fingerprint. Or, like, your, the shape of your iris. Iris shape. These are all supposedly unique among people, right? Unless you're, like, a twin or something. So a lot of biological features are unique, so why not use that 
why not use a, your finger fingerprint? Use your eye shape as uh, as your password because like you're always going to be with it, right? You are you, so you can always unlock something with those things. And so this is used a lot, like in very top security places when you really need a lot of uh, protection, like like you're you work at an airport or something like that. They use biometric security there, and uh, this unfortunately can still be hacked. So you can make like you can make a molding of somebody's fingerprint. Or uh, maybe you can make a molding of their eye shape somehow. Who knows? But you can fool biometrics these days still. It's just more difficult. Uh, and there's just a cat and mouse game going on of like, all right, let's 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 make it so that this particular hack won't work anymore. And then people come up and they find a new, they come up with new hacks to fool the, the fancier biometric systems. But it's supposedly one of the better ways to, to ensure security. So maybe we've... Maybe we've got an iPhone. I don't know what Android is doing these days. Do you still have the thing where like you draw the picture and you unlock your phone? They do cooler things. Now. No, they do. Do they do fingerprints or like face ID? I don't know. I'm an Apple fanboy. All right, so that's that. That's just an example of like maybe a good thing. It's harder to break, but still breakable. Uh, let's see. I talked to you a little bit about this before. You have security on the internet in terms of like the way that you connect to websites. Like, this is all, every website that you go to these days is HTTPS, colon, colon, or colon, slash, slash, right? There's always this little lock icon, it's like, connection secure, and then why? Got all this information. View the certificate that this website is saying, like, my class website is saying, why we trust it? Things like that. That's all here. That's called uh, TLS, Transport Layer Security. It is that, it's the S in HTTPS. Colon slash slash. You go to like Amazon. Dot com. And you look for something. That's the S. So that you don't give your credit card information to other people or your password to other people. TLS, Transport Layer Security, is how everything on the internet is kept secure. It uses cryptography to make sure it's secure. So TLS or Transport Layer Security is everywhere on the internet. It's the S in the HTTPS. And a lot of the time, it's using that thing that we learned about. It's learned, it, it uses RSA to, to make sure that everything is encrypted. RSA encryption. There it is right there. Fun. That's what the class website's using. Uh, let's see. And I'm sure every other website has similar things, like Wikipedia. Anywhere with that lock symbol, a like canvas. Are they using... Well, of course, it's secure. Verified by Amazon. What, what's their certificate say? What are they using? Oh yeah, they're totally using RSA. Cool. It's a very popular encryption algorithm. And you know a little bit about it now. So yeah, that's that's how things are kept safe. Unless you have a very fancy supercomputer, you cannot ever hope of breaking this encryption. And even if you have a fancy supercomputer, it's probably going to take you years uh, if you do it right. Which is beautiful. Uh, unless, though... Unless you are in a country where they force you to put a back door into your systems. And this is a very, very uh, controversial thing. So we should talk about it. So back doors are sometimes placed into secure systems for uh, law enforcement purposes. Because some agencies, they, they don't like when things are unbreakably encrypted. Right? Like, uh, some people really don't like Apple because they do not... Uh, they don't put any back doors into their systems, or so we think. Uh, for example, like there was a murder investigation once upon a time, and the FBI took longer than they needed to because they messed up. They they had a lot of trouble unlocking an iPhone because the con the encryption was so strong. There's a way to do it. There's a way that Apple lets you do it, but they they did it wrong, and so the encryption kind of wasted their time. They didn't like that. So a lot of the time, uh, especially back in the day, we know about this from maybe looking into Edward Snowden, right? Com countries can ask companies that like have their offices there to include little back doors for them into their software and systems so that they can look around uh, potentially when there's a warrant out or maybe if they just want to. And so that's kind of, this is the main arguments the main argument why uh, a lot of politicians wanted to ban TikTok, for example, because they had servers based in China, and th then China could ask for a backdoor and ask to see a lot of personal information that people are sending in TikTok messages, stuff like that. 
That's the idea, right? And so the question is, is this okay or ethical? Like, I think you can think of some reasons why like this would be great to have. Like, law enforcement should have this this access, or it would be a very bad thing for law enforcement to have this access or just to have it run freely. So let's have a little debate, all right? So here's the last uh, participation question for the day. This idea of putting a backdoor in your website or in your app, is it a good thing? Should companies be required to include backdoors into their software, into their systems for law enforcement to use? And so I'm going to ask you to get into groups, please, one last time. And please go to, to the written ice page. I'll clear it out. And I want us to have a little mini debate uh, amongst ourselves. Let's see, is it happy? There it goes. And uh, this is going to be based on your group number again. So pick a, a group leader and then click submit on an empty post, and that'll give you a group number. And then if you are an odd group, and if you're an odd group, I want you to say no. Sh companies should not be required to include backdoors. If you're an even group, though, I want you to say yes. Companies should be required to uh, have backdoors, and it's a good thing. All right? So that's what I'm forcing you to think about. Please come up with, for your, for your side that I'm forcing you to pick, come up with two good arguments at least and write them down, please. Give you a few minutes. We're nights were odd. So we gotta write no. What do you think companies should be required to include backdoors on their software systems for law enforcement? If you can give me some ideas, I can take it down. The government, that's a good idea, the government could misuse it, misuse it. Point the end, point. And let's think what else, let's think another idea. It could also, it could put, it could put companies in jeopardy, companies could be put into jeopardy. If they, if they could put people could lose. Which results, which results them in jeopardy, which results putting them in jeopardy, results everyone in a jeopardy, which, which, puts, which results everyone in a jeopardy. Two more minutes. I hear some good discussion. Hit it.
Mm -hmm. Like 30 more seconds to get something in there, please, and then we'll talk about it. All right. I hope that was enough time to discuss and come up with some good ideas. In either case, there are arguments for either way. Let's see what we're thinking. Nice, nice, nice. So let's look at some, let's look at the odd groups first, I guess, because that's the one I first wrote down. So why is it a bad thing to have backdoors? Why, why could it be a bad thing? Uh, so they have to protect their private information. They do not have to give access to this info. So yeah, there's, a, there's definitely a, like a like a freedom of, what is it? Freedom from being like, looked at. Privacy, there's a privacy issue, definitely. Maybe even a freedom of speech issue. So I think that's what group three is getting out there, so that's nice. Uh, let's see what else, what else? Uh -huh. So other reasons why it's a bad thing. Could A required backdoor could be a breach in privacy. This, this is a very common, yeah, this is great. This is a very common argument that you see against backdoors. If you leave a door open for somebody, who's to say that people other than law enforcement are going to walk through that door, right? So you might be hacked much easier now because you left something open for somebody. It's very easy for a hacker to find it a lot of the time. That's a great idea. Uh, companies should not be required to create back tours because it can compromise the privacy and safety of these information. So yeah, like a freedom of uh, from being watched kind of idea. Privacy issues. A right to privacy. Do we have one? Uh, you know, the users of the backdoor should not be able to freely per per peruse the data from the software. So maybe if there were warrants involved, maybe then it's okay. But like you shouldn't like just be able to look at it all willy nilly, right? Yeah, falls into the wrong hands. Yeah. So again, that argument, great. Not only one law enforcement can use it, but others could. Yes, the government could misuse it, as we have maybe seen if we looked into Snowden a little bit. Right? So, uh, yeah, people could lose confidence. Great. Steer, steer clear of buying products. Uh, like, a lot of people buy Apple products, for example, because they're big on privacy. That's the idea. That, that sometimes helps a company to, to say that they like privacy. All right, let's look at the even groups. So there are some definite arguments for why you should leave backdoors in there, because it allows law enforcement. Like, if you're using it right, you can actually, like, you can catch somebody pretty quickly because you have that access. You can stop bad things from happening in time. That's a very good thing. Uh, can help recover information if the original user is unresponsive, miss, unresponsive, missing or deceased. Yeah, that's a great idea. Sometimes you need some information, and if you don't have a backdoor, like the family needs it. If somebody dies or something, like there's there's a great way to get it. And then let's see. I believe the government should be due to national security and public safety. Uh, Help in looking for big crime. Yeah, so it would help solve crime issues. That's the idea. And hopefully there's a paper trail. Yeah. So all these are great thoughts. Any questions about any of this? Hopefully uh, it was easy to find some arguments in either case. Because there is no right. This is an ethical question, as usual, right? So because of that, why don't we just ask our boys? Let's see what they might say. What would Kant say? What would Mill say? Uh, so I think Kant would try to ask a question, as usual, with always in it. He'd be like, uh, should we always give things to law enforcement when they need it? And honestly, it could go either way. Kant's really big on personal freedom, so he might say no. Or is like, yeah, I would want law enforcement to have access to what they need to enforce the law and do it right. So I think Kant could either say yes, yes or no, depending on which of his viewpoints you, like to, you want to bring to the spotlight. So that's one way to think about it. And then Mill, what would a utilitarian say? He'd be like, what's the utility in this? What, what is the greater good? Where, which side is it on? Right. So there's, he's going to make a pro and con list. Like, what are the arguments for these these back doors? Like, it's going to help uh, save people, maybe. It's going to help convict criminals because we can get that information to to 
I can bring it to trial. Um, then there's also cons to having backdoors. Like this is private data. There should be a right to privacy. Nobody but but the people that I give it to should be allowed to see it. Stuff like that. That is uh, that is the idea. So that you could make a utilitarian say anything, assuming you you thought about this long enough. So yeah, that you can go either way as, as long as you're like, all right, this one is more important, or no, this one is more important. Do the pros outweigh the cons, or do the cons outweigh the pros? Any questions about any of that? So this would, have, this would be a fun essay to give you, too, but uh, at least we had time for a little debate. Let's see here. Yeah, if we're good, if there are no questions. That is, that's all I wanted to talk about today. Let's see if there's any assignments to give you. No, I gave you all the assignments last week, so it's just a nice calm before the storm of the midterm next week. All right. So, yeah, that is all that I have for us today. Okay.